So this first map here, as you can see, is effectively how democratic the countries in Europe are. So nothing too unusual here. Effectively, the Scandies are usually your point of reference. They, are, they have the best democratic systems. Your EU countries obviously always tend to do better. Uh, one of the reasons this, we'll get to this why the Scandies are really good, but see the EU countries now, the only odd person here is Hungary. Now, obviously, that's the one everyone's talking about at the moment. Uh, and again, for a lot of the reasons that Perry mentioned about uh, consolidation media. So unlike Australia, where we can get news from CNN, MSNBC, wherever you want to get it, with Hungary, you're stuck. You have to get Hungarian media, particularly if you're in the older old generations. So uh, effectively, Orban has managed to buy up all the TV stations and then use the government to crush what's left. Uh, he's done this by effectively uh, doling out government contracts only to sympathetic papers. So for instance, if uh, a lot of papers live and die off government, you know, don't drink drive ads, off uh, advertising, that kind of stuff, and Orban does not give any money to any paper that has ever criticised him. So all the other papers have gone out, and now we have an effective dictatorship in Hungary. But you're also going to pay attention to Poland, and we'll talk a bit about that later, Romania and Bulgaria. They're the two next ones. Can we go to the next slide? Perfect. So this is a map of Europe and effectively where the legislators sit at the moment. And I went through and depressingly did this last night. So our blues are our conservative governments, you know, effectively uh, centre right or right. Uh, obviously, when it comes to the Italians, you're now looking at far right, but that's a coalition. This is a whole different thing. Uh, Poland's getting a bit more right. Uh, your, um, your Romanians are a bit right at the moment as well. Your left or your yellows are your uh, liberal governments, you know, People like Macron, who would allow gay marriage, but also give tax cuts to the rich. You know, uh, it's very hard to put them in a left or right category, but generally they tend to fit in the right category. Your Reds are your social democrats. You know, where Labour Party would usually sit on the spectrum, uh, as well as your kind of uh, old leftover communists. Uh, again, you can see we're get, becoming a bit of an extinct species in Europe. We've got Germany, which even then were the Germans in a coalition with effectively the. Uh, the Green Party and the Liberal Party, which is the kind of yellows. So again, I wouldn't give them the full control. Uh, and, you know, they're, you know, it's Norway, they're fine, they're going to be doing that anyway. Now, the next slide is probably the most terrifying though. So if I can get you to go to the next, next one. This is how democratic Europe is going. So I, we took the data, data from 2015, uh, 2017, five years ago, and compared it to the democracy index of where it is today. Uh, Blue, more blue, the more democratic it's become. The more red or more dark red, the less democratic it's become. And just take a second to realize how undemocratic this lot of nations have become, and that's, it, it is terrifying. And again, the only strike of blue here is your Greece, uh, Macedonia, and uh, Kosovo, which again, are outliers. You know, during that period of time when 2017, effectively, they were going for a referendum about uh, North Macedonia changing its name in order to join into the, into the, the European Union and start looking that down, down that road. So that's probably would have been a red if it had been a year either side. But look at that. We are effectively looking at every single country losing democracy. And like quite a lot. So Hungary is a negative 13. Poland's a negative seven, sorry, Hungary's a negative 17, Poland's a negative 13, uh, Turkey's a negative nine. Um, effectively, these guys in Hungary, he no longer has anyone opposition left. Poland's not too far off, uh, and they went through a huge purge very recently, effectively got rid of anyone that was left uh, from the communist era, and effectively gutted the entire judicial system. So anyone who was left or had been in the party for a while was knocked out of Polish judiciary which means that effectively when the Polish government wants to do a coup or wants to do whatever it wants to do, there is very little safety checks left in Polish politics. The judicial is just gone. Uh, obviously, Italy, this is taken from January 1st. That's what Freedom House does. So Italy would probably be more right or will go more right, as Perry gave for a myriad of reasons. Uh, and Ukraine is obviously a very different kettle of fish at the moment. So the war in Ukraine is, is definitely sending countries in the wrong direction as well. So we are seeing... Uh, not only you know people passing laws because of the sort of economic crisis we're in at the moment, but we're also seeing the rise of far right parties because populism is really not about 
you know, it's not about building a party, it's about tearing something down. You know, populists do really well because they can go, I don't like the color of this bathroom wall, I want to tear it down. And when the social democrat says, well, frankly, that's going to cost $12 and we're going to have to do this and frankly, it'll be a four month contract. No, people don't care about that. They just want to tear the wall down, which is why populists do really, really well. You know, populists die when they get into policy because they don't have any policies. But in an energy crisis, in a financial crisis, in a housing crisis, that message sounds great. People aren't doing well. You know, the, the average income in these countries is going down. People are living standards are there. There's a huge energy crisis. So we are seeing particularly guys in like AFD who are, you know, diet Nazis, uh, to put it politely, um, are effectively managing to capitalize on this living crisis and going, you know, hey, you know, I know this is bad, but if we were friends with Putin, he could turn the gas back on. And that's to someone who is living paycheck to paycheck and really struggling, it's a message that kind of resonates and it's resonating really well uh, in your in Germany, in Romania, in Bulgaria, in Hungary, not so much Poland, Poland's all of the kettlefish. Uh, but as Perry also pointed out, the telegram channels are now being really interesting. So one of one of the reasons I, I'm, I'm chatting with you today is uh, I work quite closely with State Department and we look at the telegram channels coming out of Russia and particularly Russian sphere countries. Uh, Central Asia is an absolute gold mine for this. The Russians quite often test their stuff in Central Asia before they roll it out in Europe. Uh, and I'm Daniela, who's a Central Asia person herself, uh, she's an expert, she would probably know all this as well. And the telegram stuff they're doing is, com is communicating much better. It's actually getting to the messages they want and it's breeding anti-government resentment. So we are seeing, you know, Latvia is going more pro-Russia uh, until the invasion and even now the Russian diaspora is getting much more vocal inside Latvian politics. Uh, Turkey is at a point where he, may, he probably can't win the elections in the mayoral races in the really, really, really democratic cities, you know, Izmir, Istanbul, but generally the rest of the country, that's now for the APK, uh, which is per, uh, Erdogan's party. Your Balkans is getting worse. You know, they are cracking down on judiciaries. They are effectively stacking benches. Uh, and that's what we're getting with, you know, and you know, this is also compounded by the fact that a lot of these right wing parties, can we go back one slide? It doesn't matter if it can. So a lot of these right wing parties, particularly the sort of the conservatives of Britain and the, you know, the, the half the Italian electorate is first by the post, which means effectively you can have only 40% of the electorate, which is very common for the British, but because it's technically the largest party, the rights may form alliances, you know, quite often the right-wing parties in Italy won't run in any districts, they have other right-wing parties. Whereas in the, in the rest of the districts, you have six left candidates who get two votes each, and then one right-wing candidate who gets, you know, four votes. Technically, the right-wing candidate wins because he has the most votes, even though that most of the electorate didn't vote that way. And this is what the, the Russians are doing quite well, but even just conservative parties in general or parties that are anti-taxation particularly uh, tend to be doing and coalescing around. So Brexit party doesn't run in seats that uh, the conservatives are uh, going for. Uh, the same reason that some of the uh, Italian election guys, the far right guys don't run in the right seats and they just pick which ones they go with because first past the post means they'll win even if they only have a small uh, influence on the actual uh, electorate themselves. So generally, where Europe's sitting, you know, this is why we're having this conversation, is it is moving to the right. You know, as we saw in the previous slide, the majority of Europe's governments are going right. The only standouts are the Spanish and the Portuguese, which again, that's kind of usual for them. Uh, your uh, Norwegians and your Finnish, which actually is a really interesting point because particularly Finland teaches uh, disinformation as a subject in high school. So students actually learn how to tackle disinformation, how to look up sources, how to identify this is a batshit conspiracy to actual journalism. And it's the reason that disinformation is doing really poorly, particularly Russian disinformation in Finland with the younger generations. Uh, your Germans, again, have had a Christian Democrat or centre-right party that's centre-right by German standards, uh, you know, for a long time. So they are, you know, it's the SDP being in power is an anomaly. Uh, they probably will get two, three terms and they'll be out of power again. Uh, Denmark is Denmark. We don't really need to worry about that. <laughs> uh, and Switzerland has a Canton issue that's it, it really is very difficult to un, un, you know unpack that without going into the full Swiss diplomacy. But generally, the most of Europe is getting more conservative. You know, the older electoral vote, uh, 
bases are you know, voting still, the younger ones becoming disenfranchised, or they're moving in the EU to sort of these Western countries and sitting in there. You know, this is a, a pretty big worry because a lot of these guys are militant or they are nationalist or they are anti-EU. And this is one of the things that Russia would love to use Italy as leverage in, in EU negotiations. Because frankly, a lot of EU requires consensus. And if they can get one person to say no, then it doesn't pass. So usually Hungary is your go-to guy if you want something not to pass in the EU. Poland and Hungary both would, are on the bad books with Brussels because of the anti-democratic stances. Uh, so what it means is these two tend to cover each other. But if Russia can get Italy on this, that's a very large economy. Uh, it can cattle things quite easily. So I'll leave it there.